Well, it's a pleasure to see you all here and uh, plenty of seats in the middle and at the front. And do listen to Doug Hilton's uh, email. <laughs> so so, uh, so uh, it's a big task before me and I thought it was big enough, 30 years of uh, cell death and cancer research in 20 minutes, but I think it's even bigger because I saw those fantastic historical uh, perspectives <laughs> earlier on in the day. So, so this, this will probably be a bit of a disappointment. It, I'm, I'm following Don Metcalf's uh, uh, adage that uh, if you show too many colour slides, then uh, you can't be trusted. <laughs> so, uh, so cell death, uh, publications on cell death, uh, you know, the first one was in 1852, uh, uh, but for many years uh, there are ver very few. And, uh, you know, it, Kerr coined the term apoptosis in, uh, in 1972. Program cell death was used uh, early on, but from the late 1980s, there's been an explosion in interest in uh, uh, program cell death and, and especially apoptosis. Uh, so much so that now evading apoptosis is seen one of the, as one of the six original uh, hallmarks of cancer. Now, the, um, the, the way this evolved was uh, from uh, uh, patients who had uh, uh, cancer of the white blood cells, uh, in particular follicular lymphoma. And this slide was actually given to me by uh, Glenn Begley, and Glenn will probably still recognise that one if he's still here. And you can see this patient has swellings in his armpits and in his, uh, and in his neck. And if you look at the uh, chromosomes of a patient who has uh, follicular lymphoma, then uh, you often see this translocation involving chromosome 18 and, uh, and chromosome 14. And this was picked up by Janet Rowley. She also uh, was involved with uh, Peter Knoll in identification of the Philadelphia chromosome. And identification of, uh, of oncogenes at chromosome translocation breakpoints it, it was a way in a lot of the original um, uh, oncogenes were first discovered. Uh, and so, for example, MYC was uh, discovered because of a translocation, uh, chromosome translocation as well. Uh, in the case of the uh, follicular lymphoma associated translocation, the 1418 translocation, it involved a, a gene that was called uh, BCL2 for B cell lymphoma leukemia gene number two. And, and the breakpoint, uh, it was named by Carlo Croce, and, uh, and the breakpoint and, and gene was cloned by uh, Tsujimoto in Croce's lab and also by Mike Cleary at Stanford. Now, uh, uh, I first became involved with this when I joined, uh, joined Jerry's lab in uh, 1986. And this was uh, after they just published the seminal paper describing the world's best model of, uh, of leukaemia. And this is this uh, transgenic mouse that was a model of Burkitt lymphoma that has the, 14, uh, uh, the uh, 814 tra uh, translocation that activates the MYC oncogene. So this turned out not to be the first uh, MYC transgenic mouse uh, produced, but uh, by far and away, this is the, uh, the best one. Now, uh, Jerry, when he read the paper from Mike Cleary describing the, the uh, cloning of BCL2, thought, well, let's make uh, another transgenic, uh, transgenic mouse that uh, recapitulates follicular lymphoma. And so he wrote to Mike Cleary, and uh, here's Mike Cleary's uh, reply. Mike said that, um, uh, 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 he said, here's the BCL2 cDNA, but part of my current uh, uh, research in involves introduction of a human BCL2 gene into mice, into the mouse germline. So, Mike Cleary wanted to make BCL2 transgenic mice, which is exactly what uh, Jerry wanted to do. Uh, so uh, so uh, Jerry had the cDNA, but he couldn't uh, generate uh, transgenic mice. Uh, so he decided he'd give the cDNA to me and said, can you figure out if uh, BCL2 is an oncogene? It's involved in these trans translocations, but uh, there's no uh, proof that it really is a cancer gene. Now, at the time uh, in, the, in the lab, uh, a lot of people were working on FDCP1 cells. FDCP1 cells was a, an IL-3 dependent or GMCSF dependent cell line that had been produced by uh, uh, Don Metcalf when he was on sabbatical. And Wendy Cook had shown that the V-able oncogene, when introduced into these uh, uh, FDCP1 cells, would allow them to grow in the absence of growth factors and, uh, and form tumours in mice. So, uh, so FDCP1 cells seemed like an ideal way to test whether a putative oncogene was really capable of uh, transforming a normal cell into a malignant one. So I used a, a retroviral vector that uh, Ishwar Harry Harran had developed and used that to introduce BCL2 into FDCP1 cells. And uh, here's some of my, my notes, and I think the, these might be written in pencil, and you can see there's a large number of crossing outs, and so uh, you know, now 
Uh, I have a greater appreciation. There's no signatures down here or anything like that that, that that we all have in Weihai notebooks today. But this experiment involved putting BCL2 into FTCP1 cells, and these are all independent clones of cells, so there's about 20 clones of cells, and they've either got the empty uh, viral vector or they're expressing BCL2, and these cells have been starved of uh, a culture without interleukin-3 for, uh, for about four days. And you can see in the control uh, cells, V is for viable, D is for dead, there's no viable cells, and all of the ones, uh, 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 all the normal cells cultured without interleukin-3, they're all dead cells. Uh, but in contrast, uh, the ones expressing BCL2, uh, uh, although there are some dead cells, in almost every case there's also some live cells that were visible. Now, this was different to uh, what happened when you put V-able into the cells. If you put V-able into the cells, then, uh, then the cells would start proliferating. And so you have many thousands of cells. And, you had, and I found many thousands of cells when I included interleukin-3 in the cultures. So BCL2 was acting differently to V-able. It wasn't allowing cells to proliferate in the absence of growth factor. It, was, it wasn't acting like an accelerator on the cell, but it was stopping the cells from being able to kill themselves. And, uh, and if you looked at the control cells when they're starved of interleukin-3, you can see they lose membrane integrity, they, they compress their DNA they, uh, they, and they cleave it, and, and these are all the classic signs of apoptosis. Whereas cells starved of growth factor that express BCL2, the cells uh, retain their intact uh, cell membrane and, uh, and DNA, and moreover, if you add back interleukin-3, then the cells are able to proliferate once again. So it used to be thought that growth factor provided uh, a, a signals to a cell that stimulated cell survival and proliferation. But if you took away growth factor, then you got no survival and no proliferation. But these experiments showed that there must be some sort of a branching signal downstream of the receptor so that uh, uh, growth factor gave, a, a, gave separate signals to lead to proliferation and also to prevent uh, an uh, uh, autonomous activation of a cell death signal and BCL2 could block that signal. So if you took away growth factor from cells that had lots of BCL2, there was no longer any proliferation because there was no signals from the growth factor receptor, but the cell didn't undergo uh, programmed cell death or apoptosis because of the activity of BCL2. So BCL2, uh, so these experiments showed there were distinct, there's distinct genetic control of cell division and cell survival, that uh, BCL2 specifically inhibits cell suicide, BCL2 was, became the first component of the mechanism for cell death to be recognised. And because BCL2 was associated with follicular lymphoma, it, it showed that inhibition of cells' ability to kill themselves uh, can lead to cancer. Now, uh, of course, this was, uh, this was wonderful. We published this, uh, the, this paper in, in Nature. And uh, you'll see here that it's also referring to CMYK and the ability of BCL2 to uh, cooperate with CMYK. Now, um, uh, because I had these retroviruses that I could use to infect the uh, FTCP1 cells, uh, the thought was, well, maybe the reason the FTCP1 cells expressing BCL2 aren't able to form tumours is you might need two oncogenic changes to turn a normal cell into a cancer cell. So given that uh, uh, Suzanne and Jerry had these NIC transgenic mice and I had a BCL2 virus, I thought I'd put the BCL2 virus onto uh, bone marrow cells uh, from... Uh, normal mice and mic mice. So this is showing some cultures, uh, and you can see there's four lines here. Uh, it's, uh, it's a long culture of bone marrow cells infected with mock virus or BCL2 expressing virus. But the only time that uh, uh, clones would grow out or a cell line would grow out is in those lines that were from mic bone marrow and, uh, and contained the BCL, infected with the BCL2 virus. And it worked here and it here and, and a third time uh, here. So it was showing that mic and BCL2 could cooperate. But when doing these experiments, I was always worried that maybe uh, the mice, the donors of the bone marrow, had a preclinical uh, MYC induced uh, lymphoma. So MYC and BCL2 immortalized, uh, made immortalized cell lines that caused lymphoma when injected into mice. Uh, but uh, I thought a more elegant way of doing this experiment would be to make BCL2 transgenic mice and then cross BCL2 transgenic mice with MYC transgenic mice. And, uh, and so I went with Jerry into his office and we rang up Mike Cleary and, uh, and said, look, can we now have your permission to make BCL2 transgenic mice? And Mike Cleary said, well, he'd made BCL2 transgenic mice and they had no phenotype, so he said that we were free to uh, go ahead. 
And, uh, and these experiments were helped uh, greatly by uh, when, uh, when Sue Bath joined the lab because Sue Bath was an expert at making transgenic mice. And, uh, and together we made over 25 primary uh, transgenic uh, mouse strains and, uh, and used them uh, firstly to, to analyse them and then to cross with the emu mick uh, strains. And this just shows my notes from uh, 1989 uh, doing uh, fax analysis on one of these MYC BCL2 double transgenics. And this was a mouse that died when it was only uh, 38 days old, which was much younger than the uh, MYC single transgenics uh, died. Uh, and these are a couple more mice. Uh, uh, you can see here, this is the, my notes of the autopsies on a couple more of the transgenics. This one uh, died, it uh, was only uh, 35 days old. This one died, it was only 38 days old. And uh, uh, so these are two of the, uh, uh, of the initial nine BCL2 MYC uh, double transgenic mice. But the other thing I'd like you to note here is, uh, is this word over here, fax. Andreas, because <laughs> this is the time when Andreas uh, joined the lab. He'd come from doing his uh, PhD in Switzerland. And, uh, and once Andreas joined the lab, uh, we, we passed the baton, as it were, and, uh, and then uh, Andreas ran, and uh, boy, did he run with it. Uh, here's the first uh, uh, result of, of, uh, of these experiments. You can see that the, while the BCL2 mice don't develop tumours uh, until they're very old, uh, the MYC mice do develop uh, lymphoma, but if you have both MYC and BCL2 in these double transgenics, then they get tumours extremely rapidly. Uh, Andreas also, be, having training as an immunologist, he also recognised that although the BCL2 transgenic mice didn't die uh, at a, 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 of lymphoma, uh, many of them did die early, but he recognised that they were dying of an autoimmune-like disease. And this disease resembled the systemic lupus erythematosus. They had uh, immune deposit, uh, complexes depositing in the kidneys. They had antibodies to uh, DNA. And, uh, and uh, against a lot of scepticism in the, in the Institute, uh, he, he went ahead, uh, together with great help from Senga Whittingham, one of the world's experts on uh, autoimmune antibodies, uh, published this paper, uh, which provided the first experimental evidence that inhibition of cell death uh, could lead to autoimmune disease, or, or the corollary of that is that cell death is needed to remove potentially autoreactive cells. Uh, he also showed that, uh, went on to show that uh, uh, BCL2 transgene inhibits uh, uh, um, uh, 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 thymic uh, uh, censorship of autoreactive cells, uh, T cells, and, uh, and, uh, and showed also that uh, uh, BCL2 uh, could inhibit uh, cell death by, induced by a whole lot of mechanisms, including uh, radiation via P53 and also uh, a wide variety of other mechanisms. And this is particularly important because it suggested that uh, drugs that inhibit BCL2 might not only be useful in treating uh, uh, follicular lymphoma that overexpresses BCL2, but might be in, in, important or might be able to reduce the, the dosage of conventional chemotherapy and radiation that you need to, uh, to treat malignancies. Uh, and then uh, Liam O'Connor uh, joined the lab and, uh, and he was responsible for cloning uh, uh, BIM, one of the BH3 only proteins that antagonises uh, BCL2 family members. Uh, Philip Bouillet knocked out uh, uh, BIM and showed its role in, uh, in, uh, auto, in the immune system in a couple of very highly cited papers. Uh, uh, Hamsa Pathalakath uh, showed that uh, BIM plays a very important role in, uh, in a, a signalling of ER stress. Uh, there, are, there must be something like uh, eight or so of these um, so-called BH3 only proteins and, and uh, clearly the most important ones are BIM and uh, Puma. Uh, Jerry, of course, he was still interested in his uh, uh, MYC transgenic mice and uh, he used them uh, uh, together with uh, Egal Halpt and, and Warren Alexander to identify further oncogenes by looking at uh, insertion of, uh, of retroviruses and that allowed them to clone the, uh, the BMI gene. Uh, Jerry then uh, focused once again on cell death pathways and uh, he and Suzanne and uh, Leonie Gibson were able to clone BCLW, another uh, anti-apoptotic BCL2 family member. Uh, Hamsa Pathalakath cloned BMF, yet another one of these BH3 only proteins. Uh, all of these results are uh, fr from WeHi. We, of course, uh, decided to uh, uh, change tack and look at uh, other pathways uh, that regulate cell death. And the lead uh, we took was to, um, uh, was by, uh, uh, came from viruses. Many viruses carry BCL2 homologs. So adenovirus carries a BCL2 homolog, 
Uh, Epstein-Barr virus has a BCL2 homologue. So a gr great way to look for new regulators of, uh, of cell death is to look at the genes encoded by viruses. Lois Miller in the States that identified the uh, uh, IAPs or inhibitor of apoptosis proteins in viruses that infect insect cells. So we uh, looked for homologues of those viruses in mammalian cells and uh, Anthony Ren, Miha Pakush uh, uh, helped clone uh, a whole family, a whole new family of uh, mammalian IAP uh, 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 genes. Uh, 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 with the help of uh, Mark Hines and, uh, and uh, in particular Catherine Day, we were able to uh, determine the structure of the BIR or baculoviral IAP repeat domain, which is the uh, characteristic, uh, the, the, the domain that uh, characterises all of these uh, IAP proteins and turned out to be a novel zinc binding uh, fold. Uh, uh, some years later, with uh, Anne Verhagen, uh, we were able to identify uh, uh, proteins that stick to the IAPs that are able to inhibit their uh, uh, activity to promote uh, cell death. And uh, you'll see here, this is, uh, this is, I think, the first paper I've mentioned uh, where, uh, where John Silk is involved, but he was also sharp enough to notice the similarities that had been missed by everybody else in the world between Grim Hidden Reaper, the insect viral IAP antagonists, and uh, the amino, processed amino termini of uh, SMAC Diablo and the other uh, IAP binding proteins that uh, Anne Verhagen had identified. And it was this uh, letter that we, and of course, we initially sent it to Nature, got bounced from there. We just sent it as a letter to the editor, Cell Death and Differentiation. But it was noticed there by Yi Gong Shi, who was establishing a company that uh, eventually uh, became called uh, Tetralogic. Uh, and so uh, here's a, a slide here. You've seen this picture before from uh, Glenn Begley. Uh, this uh, led to the development of Barinapant, where it's a, a dimer that uh, each, each half of it resembles the four first amino acids of, uh, of Smack Diablo. And uh, uh, as Glenn said, these, uh, uh, these IAP antagonists were designed to uh, bind to XIAP, but uh, it was work uh, largely from uh, John Silk and James Vince that showed that the real target of uh, uh, these smac mimetic compounds was not XIAP, but was CIAP1. And that uh, just minutes after adding barinopan to cells or, or these other uh, smac mimetic compounds, uh, CIAP1 uh, disappears from the cell by dimerizing, auto-ubiquitilating and being degraded in the proteasome. Uh, so, uh, and, and uh, Glenn has also mentioned uh, much more recent work from uh, Mark Pellegrini's lab showing that uh, these uh, smac mimetic compounds might not only have a role in, in uh, treating cancer, but uh, might have a role in, in allowing the immune system to uh, get rid of intracellular parasites such as uh, hepatitis B virus. Uh, and uh, so we're eagerly awaiting the results of the clinical trials both uh, for um, myelodysplastic syndrome and for uh, uh, hepatitis B. Now, going back to the, uh, the BCL2 family of proteins, uh, here's, a, here's a letter that I uh, wrote to, to Jerry back in uh, 2001. And uh, I was a consultant uh, with uh, IDUN, a company at the time. This is a company started up by uh, Bob Horvitz uh, and others. And uh, they were interested in, uh, in cell death uh, mechanisms. And uh, uh, Tillman Altersdorf was one of the employees that, uh, uh, at uh, IDUN that I used to speak to regularly on the, on the phone. And... Um, uh, Idun had been contacted by, uh, by Abbott, and, and in, in particular uh, Steve Fezzik at Abbott, because Abbott had developed some, uh, uh, some uh, small molecules that antagonized, uh, bound to and antagonised BCL2 family members. Uh, but they were wanting, to, uh, wanting to some help from cellular biologists at Idun to help them, and uh, Tillman uh, called me. Uh, they wanted to uh, extend their experiments outside uh, chemistry and, uh, and into some animal models, and I suggested that the MIC BCL2 um, mouse models would be um, an ideal system in which to try these. And they were interested in this because the Onco mouse, which is the first MIC transgenic mouse developed uh, by Phil Leader's lab, uh, was covered by uh, strong patents, whereas they didn't have a patent uh, protection in Australia, so, and we had these MIC BCL2 uh, uh, transgenic mice. So this just seemed like, uh, like heaven. And uh, they said they were keen to collaborate, and, uh, and, uh, they were, and so this is the genesis of the collaboration uh, that led to the uh, arrangements with uh, Abbott and then Genentech uh, uh, and, uh, and the association with WeHi. 
Uh, so that was the reason that uh, it was at WEHI that we first uh, got access to ABT uh, 737, and this is the first paper from WEHI uh, describing uh, uh, use of that uh, compound. Um, and that then led on to, uh, uh, to clinical trials uh, involving uh, uh, studies with Navitaclax or ABT263, which is the clinical, uh, uh, clinical version of the, uh, this BCL2 antagonist. And, uh, and it was also at WEHI, as you've heard before, that it was realised that um, uh, this drug, uh, Navitaclax, caused, uh, w w was likely to cause uh, problems with platelets because uh, of discoveries that uh, Kylie Mason and, uh, and Ben Kyle made that uh, uh, BCLXL was important for maintenance of uh, platelet lifespan. And that prompted the development in this three-way collaboration between AbbVie and uh, Genentech and WeHi that led to the de development of ABT199 or Venetoclax uh, that's now looking extremely encouraging in uh, clinical trials. Of course, the, the brilliant structural biologists and municipal chemists we have at, at WeHi uh, are still going on to find yet more compounds such as their very exciting uh, inhibitor of uh, BCLXL. So here's uh, uh, BCL2 with uh, uh, ABT199, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, we're all very delighted to hear that um, uh, the FDA has given this uh, uh, breakthrough uh, uh, therapy designation, and uh, everybody's hopeful that uh, in the not too different, uh, d distant future, it might be available uh, in the clinic. So here is the, the past of uh, cell death research. I really should have started the slide way out here on the edge because it was 1842 that it all started, but uh, then it would just like a, look like the letter L. But here's the growth in publications on, uh, on cell death research. Here are some of the key events that have occurred at WEHI that's in many ways helped to propel this, uh, this growth. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, acknowledge the, the large numbers of funders of this work, in particular the NHMRC, uh, but many other additional um, uh, funding bodies. Of course, the donors to WEHI, uh, in particular, I'd like to just mention uh, uh, Eddie Brownstein, who funded some of the initial work in developing the MYC transgenic mice and, uh, and funded uh, uh, WEHI uh, very generously uh, uh, over many years. Uh, also, uh, companies, I'm on the scientific advisory board of Tetralogic, so I'd like to declare that. I used to be on the uh, consultant for IDUN. Uh, and uh, Genentech and AbbVie, of course, are arranged currently, uh, uh, have an arrangement currently with WeHi. Uh, I'd like to thank the clinicians, Andy Robert and all of his team, the patients who have been uh, are willing to take these drugs. Of course, goodness knows how many mice. Too many WeHi colleagues to mention, as well as researchers throughout Australia and the rest of the world. And uh, I just made it maybe a little over. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>